All right, uh, 13-4, we're going to talk about, kind of gave away the secret, didn't I? The Mexican War. All right, last election we talked about, or last lecture we talked about James K. Polk uh, winning the election. Remember, he believes in manifest destiny, that it's America's right and duty to spread, you know, their ideas, their democratic beliefs, everything from coast to coast. Uh, remember previously, uh, we had offered to buy New Mexico from the country of Mexico, and they had refused, and they are very upset. Um, James K. Polk has also said that he's going to annex Texas and Oregon. Well, let's see what happens. All right. James K. Polk has won the election, and he's going to keep his word, at least to a certain extent. You know, he has come in with the uh, campaign motto of 50 for 50 or 50 for 50 or fight. 50 for 50 or fight, right? Which means... Um, we are going to demand that the British give us all the land up to 5440 North, all right? Or fight. Well, here's the deal. James K. Polk is in no way going to go to war with, uh, with Great Britain over Oregon. He knew that. The people probably should have known he, w- he wasn't serious. So what happens is he makes out a compromise with Great Britain, and it divides the Oregon country on the 49-degree north latitude, all right? So the British got north of that line, and we got south of that line. So this should be one lesson to you. Politicians will often tell you one thing and then deliver on another. His campaign motto, 5440 or fight, ends up being 49 degrees north, okay? Now, the Oregon Territory now belongs to the United States. Three states are going to come out of this uh, large territory. It's going to be Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. All right. So here's what happens. Okay, so James K. Polk has gotten the Oregon Territory. But next, he looks at Texas. Now, in 1844, remember after the Texans had won the, uh, the war with uh, Mexico, at least they've beaten, you know, Santa Ana at the ba- Battle of San Jacinto, um, they have a lot of problems in Texas. They are constantly under the threat of attack from Native Americans, They are in a large amount of debt. Most of them are Americans anyways, and they want to join the United States, but the United States hasn't let them, right? They've asked repeatedly, and the United States says no. In 1844, Sam Houston, who was the president of the Lone Star Republic, signed a treaty of annexation with the United States, but the Senate disallows it, disallows it. So Houston, you know, he's very upset. Remember, he wants to desperately join the United States. He goes, well, if you don't want us to join the United States, I know that Great Britain would like to have us. What? Yeah, you know, if America doesn't want us, maybe Britain will. Well, this throws the Americans into a tizzy. They do not want Britain in the continental United States. Oh, my gosh, look, we've already had a war of independence. We've had the War of 1812. The last thing we want is for the Great Britain to get a toehold into the central part of the United States. So we go, oh, okay, okay, okay. We will take you, which is going to make a lot of people in the South happy. Um, remember, there's going to be a slave state, but we risk war with Mexico now. Now, this annexation of Texas is going to uh, completely um, blow the Mexicans' mind. They are furious. Remember, they have never accepted the tech. Oh, doggone it. They have never accepted Texas independence. All right? So they see this as the United States trying to grab their legal land. They also feel that the United States, you know, if they get uh, Texas, they might cause an uprising in California. Right? So Mexico sees this as a threat not only just to Texas, but also to other parts of the New Mexico Territory. Now, Americans are very, very upset with Mexico also. We have now offered $30 million for the New Mexico Territory. Remember, we bought the Louisiana Purchase for $15 million. We're doubling that to $30 million, and Mexico has the audacity to say no. And many Americans are upset about it. Now, what's really going to start the war is going to be a border dispute, okay? A border dispute. They, there is disputed territory between the Rio Grande River and the Nueces River, all right? And it's in southern Texas. Well, the United States claims it. Mexico claims it. 
Well, President Polk orders American troops to basically occupy that land. Well, Mexico says that's their land, so they send soldiers in. A battle uh, develops, as you might well imagine, and soldiers on both sides are killed. Well, now James K. Polk now has an excuse. James K. Polk says to Congress that American blood has been shed, that Mexico has invaded, and ask Congress for a declaration of war, which he gets. Now, many people are eager to fight this war, especially in the South. Not so much up in the Northeast, not so much up in uh, maybe in the Midwest, but in the South and in the West, they love it. Some Americans thought the war was unjust. They thought this is just a Southern plot for them to add more slave states, okay? And it might very well be. But regardless of what people thought, we are now at war with Mexico. We, the United States of America, has declared war on Mexico. And I'll tell you what, the uh, United States does not hold back. The United States attacked on several fronts. This isn't going to be just a one, you know, pronged attack. We're going to attack them from the north. We're going to attack them from sea. We're going to attack all the way overland through New Mexico, even into California. So General Zachary Taylor, who is going to become a, you know, a president and very famous also, he is going to cross the Rio Grande River and he attacked northern Mexico. Um, he's outnumbered, actually. His troops are, have less men than Mexico. But he meets General Santa Ana. Santa Ana is once again, you know, popping up at the Battle of Buena Vista. All right. Why does it keep doing that? All right. Sorry about that, guys. Buena Vista. Although the Americans are outnumbered, they are better led. Zachary Taylor is a, is a war hero. He's a good general. And he defeats Santa Ana. Santa Ana is not a very good military commander. You say how he had lost his troops at, uh, you know, uh, basically sacrificed his troops at the Alamo uh, as, as troops had been defeated at the Battle of San Jacinto. He fancies himself the Napoleon of the West, but he is not a military commander. He's a dictator, all right? And he is defeated by General Zachary Taylor. Now, the next general we need to know, General Winfield Scott, who also is going to come on to be a great war hero, and an early later in the American Civil War, landed at the port city of Veracruz, and he took that city. And then, and by the way, Veracruz is on the east coast of Mexico, on the you know the Gulf of Mexico. He lands troops there. They take the city of Veracruz, and then he starts marching towards Mexico City, the capital. All right. Now we have a third army led by General Stephen Kearney. Now he captures, he, he goes overland, he captures the capital of New Mexico, which is, you know, New Mexico territory, which is Santa Fe. After he cat, and he, there's hardly any fight there at all, he just basically marches in and takes it over. He then heads towards California and he captures the very important city of San Diego. Now, Americans who've been living in California, you know, they, they kind of hear about this war with Mexico and the Americans are eager to join um, or have California become part of the United States, well, they lead a revolt. So Americans living in Northern California lead a revolt, and they declared California an independent republic. So just like the Lone Star Republic, for a time, California had its own country too, and they called that the Bear Flag Republic. And if you look at the state flag of California, you will see a grizzly bear on it, and it's, it goes all the way back to the time when California had declared themselves an independent republic which they called the Bear Flag Republic. A fourth general, John C. Fremont, Fremont, Nebraska, by the way, is named after him, drove Mexican forces out of California. So you see that this war is happening, you know, uh, all over. The United States is much better equipped uh, and, and obviously much better led than the Mexican forces. All right. Okay, so you remember General Scott. He had landed at the uh, port city of Veracruz, Veracruz and he has marched to Mexico City for the final battle. Now, Mexican soldiers, you know, they're, they may not be properly led or, you know, but they, they're brave. And they put up a fierce resistance at Chapultepec, okay? And they are greatly outnumbered by the Americans. Chapultepec is kind of like their Alamo. They're greatly outnumbered. Mexican forces uh, uh, are defeated by Americans at Chapultepec. It's a, fort a fortress just outside of Mexico City. Uh, today, it's a, it's a big monument. Many people go there from Mexico to kind of celebrate the brave heroes 
of the war with Mexico, just like Americans go to Al the Alamo to celebrate the, uh, you know, the bravery of American forces against Santa Ana. All right? But now, the capital has been captured, and Mexico ends up suing for peace. All right, kind of um, give that away. With, without their capital, you know, uh, they're occupied in California. The American forces have not been stopped really anywhere. The Mexican government asked for a peace agreement. So the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848, Mexico has to give up all the land in exchange for $15 million. Do, they, do you remember what I told you at the beginning of this lesson? What had we originally offered for this land? $30 million. But since you didn't take it, since we had to go to war, since Americans died, we're going to take your land, and we're only going to give you $15 million. These lands were called the Mexican Cession. The Mexican Cession. To cede means to give up. So the Mexicans had to give up all of that land. Now, there's one more small piece that we need to talk about. 1853, five years after this, American looks at this little strip of land that goes uh, across southern Arizona. And they want this land too. So they go to the Mexicans and say, hey, we want to buy this strip of land. Now, if you're in Mexico, what do you think? Uh, if we don't sell it to them, they might take it. So the Mexicans are like, okay, okay, absolutely, sure. We'll sell it to you. So they buy this strip of land. It's called the Gadsden Purchase for $10 million. Americans want to build a railroad that goes uh, to the Pacific, to San Diego, basically, from, I think, El Paso. And um, so that completes um, the purchase of, uh, I mean, uh, the acquisition of the land that we have for Mexico. So $15 million for the original Mexican session, $10 million more for the gadgets and purchase, altogether $25 million for that land. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? That is all the land that we have today, if you think about it. I have told you how we have acquired everything from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean, from Florida, Texas, the Mexican Cession, the Oregon Territory. All of it now belongs to the United States, and this is the land that we presently know as the continental United States. All right? Now that we have this land, we've grabbed the Mexican Cession. You know, you would think that we'd be happy. you think that we're complete. But I'm going to tell you this right now, folks. Getting this land is going to be a curse for America. Is this land going to be free or is it going to be slave? That is going to be one of the major causes of the Civil War, which we'll get to later on. All right? There you have it. The War with Mexico. 1840, what was it? Hang on. 1846 to 1848. The two-year war that is going to give us the land of the Mexican session.